Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now this is the RTX 4070. Today we'll be testing it with 18 games of various ages and demandingness, if that's even a word. It's a little higher end than the stuff I normally look at, but unlike most other reviews you'll see today, I've paired it with a more modest setup. I'll expand on that a little later on. First though, let's talk about this model specifically. This is the MSI Ventus 3X version. It has a single 8-pin connector, which is a pleasant surprise and it looks great overall. On paper it's clocked at 1920MHz and boosts to 2475. In real world usage it actually goes quite a bit beyond that. 2775 seem to be the most common reading. The triple fans stop under low load and when they do spin up they are very quiet and keep the card very cool. I'm talking just over 60 degrees max in my testing but then again I don't have a side panel on my case. Let's get into some games. I've got this card paired with my i5-12 400F and 32 gigs of DDR4. This is probably as low as I'd recommend going as far as a processor pairing, but it'll be interesting to see how well this combo works, and it should help you decide if you want to upgrade to a card like this one if you don't have a higher end gaming rig. Let's see the MSI RTX 4070 12 gig GDDR6 in action then, starting in no particular order with Forza Horizon 5. For the settings we have the Ultra preset with TAA. There really shouldn't be any need for any upscaling techniques here as this is widely regarded as a very well optimised game. Because of that I thought I'd go with 2160p or 4k resolution. I definitely could have gone higher to be honest because even with Ultra at 2160p we were getting over 100fps without any issues. This figure will only increase outside of multi-competitor races. There were no frame dips or drops anywhere to report and so we are off to a very solid start for Nvidia's newest 40 series card. In Red Dead Redemption 2 I went with the console equivalent settings but opted for 2160p resolution yet again. Reason being is that these settings combine graphical quality with performance and that's always a good place to start. In Red Dead I've always found that as long as you have the ultra texture quality enabled the game is going to look really good no matter what you choose to do with everything else. These settings use a mixture of everything, high, low, ultra, medium. This game does support DLSS but again I don't think it's really necessary here as we are averaging over 90 frames per second in and around Valentine, with this average figure and the percentile lows increasing in more open spaces. It still looks really good too. Red Dead is a few years old now but it's still very visually impressive even when it isn't maxed out. The Cyberpunk 2077 test gave me a chance to check out the new DLSS frame generation technology. I've heard about it but I've never tried it as I've never tested a 40 series card before but it should improve frame rate figures in supported games and should benefit us in CPU limited situations too. Ideal here then as Cyberpunk can and will likely use a lot of the 12400F's available resources. Aside from enabling this option I went with the high settings all round and enabled quality DLSS. The base resolution was set to 1440p. I've included figures from a test with the frame generation setting turned off as well for comparison's sake. You don't have to enable this of course but it is there and definitely worth trying to see what difference it makes with your setup. I can make a full video about this if you want, testing out more supported titles and seeing how frame rates are affected. In Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 I went with the extreme preset at 1440p, nothing else was changed. I left the anti-aliasing option at normal for no real reason other than it doesn't really look much different at high. The in-game resolution is set to 1440p natively with no upscaling methods enabled here. The game looks good and it runs well, though performance will differ from map to map. As you can see by the MSI Afterburner stats, the CPU is sitting back and relaxing while the 4070 puts in the work, albeit consuming much less than 200 watts of power here. I tend to enable the power consumption overlay now as I think that's a pretty important factor these days, and it's safe to say the 4070 isn't a extremely power hungry card at all, as you'll see throughout this video. It's nice to see a very capable card output these figures, and it means that versions like the MSI one here can use a slimmer and lighter cooler design. It's two slots wide in my PC, which may not seem like an important factor for some, but it's nice to have all the extra breathing room inside my Micro ATX case. 
Deathloop is a game I haven't played in a while, but one I very much enjoy. I thought I was definitely taking a bit of a risk by opting for a native 4K resolution, especially when combining that with the very high preset. I do recall having some performance issues in the past with this one, but safe to say that here everything runs well and looks really good. We're getting over 80 FPS natively with percentile lows that also stick to above 60 FPS, so it's a very smooth experience all round. Of course you could enable DLSS if you wanted to here, or just drop the native res for a faster experience, but I find this more than playable to be honest. I've included Dying Light in these benchmarks because I've been playing it a lot recently, and when the visuals are turned way up it can still give powerful systems a good run for their money. Here I chose the highest settings as I didn't expect to have any problems, though I did turn a few options off simply out of personal preference. Nothing that should alter performance. As you might expect, this runs like a dream, 2160p with over 90 FPS on average. The 4070 isn't intended as a native 4K gaming card, but it can handle it in a good selection of games, that's for sure, and it's definitely worth trying in those older titles, ones that perhaps you had a little bit of trouble with when they first came out. Elden Ring is capped at 60 FPS by default, so I figured that we should have no trouble hitting this with the maximum preset again at 2160p. It isn't just old games that the 4070 can manage at 4K resolution, by the way, as proved here. I turned off motion blur and depth of field as always, and also left ray tracing off. This one hit 60 FPS no problem, with a couple of little dips every so often, but nothing major. The game looks very good overall. This pairing is doing pretty well so far. I wanted to test a more mid-range CPU as I think a lot of people might have an older 20 or 30 series card with a more reasonably priced processor and could potentially be wondering if an upgrade is worth it. Perhaps you just want to build something brand new and want to know if you can spend a little bit less on the processor side of things. Hopefully these tests will help you out but hopefully they'll also give you a good idea of the 4070's performance in general. In Fortnite I wanted to try and combine good graphics with solid performance because the Unreal Engine 5 upgrade this got makes it look incredible. With that in mind I went with 1440p resolution and the medium preset. I also enabled lumen and high virtual shadows while activating ray tracing as well. I did think this was probably going to be a bit much for the hardware, at least as far as trying to maintain solid frame rates, but Against what I thought was my better judgement, I didn't enable any upscaling or reduce the resolution scaling. Even so, the FPS was pretty good, and the game looked nice as well. Honestly, if you're playing a bit more seriously and competitively, then I'd recommend turning the visual options way down, but it's nice to see that we can get some really great looking graphics out of this game, and still maintain a decent frame rate at 1440p. Now despite the age of GTA 5, it can still be quite intensive if you turn everything way up, which is what I did today, at 2160p resolution as well. I did leave MSAA off as this isn't really necessary, but it will totally destroy frame rates without making much of a graphical difference at this res. All the advanced options were also set to on and to their respective maximums. Gameplay wise, over 100 FPS on average here, no matter what we were doing and where we were on the map. 1440p is definitely the overall sweet spot for this card, but as I said, there are a good few titles where 2160p is more than doable. GTA still looks good when everything is turned right up, and I still tend to benchmark it more often than not because it's continuously popular. But let's move on. Now I just had to include 2018's Kingdom Come Deliverance in these benchmarks. Back in the day, or even still, if you chose the ultra high preset, you get a warning about how this is an experimental mode intended for future hardware. I think it's safe to assume that five years on, the technology that the developers had in mind probably exists now, so I decided to try this on the highest settings, albeit without HD textures, as I have run out of SSD space at this point. This should still be pretty challenging for the 4070 though. Here we are in Retire, one of the more system intensive areas, and a beautiful looking area at that. This still holds up so well graphically, and with the 4070 we are just about averaging 60 FPS. There are dips in and around the town centre, which is exactly what I was expecting. I remember testing this out last year with a 3070 and hitting 52 on average, so things are a bit better now with this card. I finally got a piece of hardware that can hit 60 FPS at 4K Ultra in KCD. Never thought I'd see the day. 
The Last of Us Part 1 loves a bit of VRAM, it loves a bit of system memory too, and according to the in-game menu, the high settings were just about right for my system. This is what it actually defaulted to, so I thought, yeah, why not? The game is running at native 1440p, and all I did is turn off motion blur and depth of field as personal preferences. As you can see, it looks incredible and runs pretty well too. There have been a couple of little patches, and I'm sure they've done something for the performance. It might have even improved again, um, since I actually recorded this benchmark gameplay, but the game does still take a while to build shaders at the start, and it is a CPU hog. This is partly why I wanted to test it. It can be troublesome, but with the right settings, it can run fairly well. And these are the settings that I definitely stick with, with a card like this. What's an RTX benchmark video without Minecraft RTX, right? I recently added this again due to popular demand and I forgot how good it looks. Settings wise, we have everything fancy enabled with a ray tracing render distance of 20 chunks. Upscaling is enabled, but the base resolution is set to 3840 by 2160. This is the Nvidia medieval map and it always looks so good. It reminds me of Kingdom Come Deliverance, actually. If there's a Kingdom Come Minecraft project out there, please let me know. Anyway, I'm getting distracted. The game runs well and it looks really good, with lighting and water in particular really standing out here. Who would have thought Minecraft could look so nice? Not much to report with the Overwatch 2 settings, native 2160p here, all upscaling was off and no dynamic frame rate target was enabled. Epic was also the chosen preset. In game and we were getting over 100 FPS, the percentile lows were almost as high as the average so this one ran really well without so much as a tiny hiccup in performance. It looks pretty good too. Again this isn't the sort of game where maxing out the visuals makes much sense because it still looks very similar at low and performance will massively improve but it's nice to see that we can even if maybe we shouldn't or we don't need to. Portal with RTX is a great visual showcase, but it is definitely demanding. This is where frame generation came in handy once again, though DLSS was also set to ultra performance. The original Portal is actually one of the easiest games to run out there, so it's always interesting to see how playing the RTX version can impact things. I forgot to take a recording of the settings I used, but no changes were made, it was just the ultra preset from the graphical menu. And that's all there is to it. Look at the CPU usage, it's barely breaking a sweat here. Resident Evil 4 has a ray tracing preset which makes things nice and simple. All I did in addition to selecting the ray tracing preset was turn off motion blur and depth of field as I do in every game. This is still the demo, I know, so bear that in mind, but performance and graphics wise this plays really well and looks incredible. I was testing this at night and it's seriously worth it with all the lights off. The atmosphere is tense, um, a good average frame rate here and at native 2160p I'm surprised to see these solid results. The percentile lows were also good as well to go along with the average. I'll add the full game to my library soon, I promise, but this should still give you a good idea of how this game performs with hardware like this. Skyrim Special Edition next, and I've included it because it's Skyrim after all, it's a classic. It's still popular as well, and it still looks good when things are turned right up. I uncapped the frame rate in the INI file, went with the Ultra Preset and 2160p resolution. Again, nothing else was changed, and while the physics got totally messed up by my changes um, to the INI file, it was worth it to see how high we could go frame rate wise. I forgot to record the settings menu again, but as I said, Ultra with nothing else changed here, and the performance was incredibly smooth. I expected nothing less, of course, from this aging title, but nice to see Skyrim in action as always. Still has plenty of players daily as well, according to the Steam Most Played chart. In Spider-Man, I decided to push things again, this time to the high preset and 2160p res. I also enabled ray tracing and selected the available high options. Nothing else was changed from the preset. Object range was set to 5. I thought for sure this would have some issues, but no, at native 2160p we were getting over 80 FPS. DLSS is available here of course if you want, and again, you could lower the resolution if you wanted better performance, but to me this is more than enough. I still use a 60Hz 1080p display with my main gaming rig, so it's always nice to treat my eyes to a higher resolution by hooking my PC up to the TV instead. There are performance drops in the usual places, busy park areas and crowded streets will cause this, but I think the CPU is more to blame here, and for the most part the game is very solid. 
To finalise we have The Witcher 3 with its next gen patch. I enabled DLSS frame generation once again here and the base resolution was set to 1440p. I opted for the RT Ultra preset and didn't change anything else. DLSS was also set to quality. This honestly looks amazing. Just like with Cyberpunk I've included figures from before and after enabling frame generation so you can see the difference with the generated frames. Now not everyone will want to use this setting of course and you don't have to but it is nice to have and it certainly enhanced my Witcher 3 experience. The biggest problems with this game are going to be found in busier areas. Frame generation alleviated some of the big issues I was having in the populated market area perhaps more of a CPU intensive place, but 60 FPS was still doable as an average with this option turned off. The percentile lows will suffer a bit more though. But there we go, the MSI 4070 in action, 18 games tested with various settings and resolutions, in pairing with my mid-range i5 12400 FPC. Thanks to Nvidia and MSI for sending this card over for us to look at today. Uh, it was a very last minute thing, but a very welcome surprise indeed. Thanks to all of you for watching as well. As always, let me know what you think in the comments. I do like to spend my evening reading your thoughts down below. And as always, if you enjoyed it, leave a like, leave a dislike if you didn't. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And hopefully I'll see all of you in the next one.